Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this podcast, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen at S2 Breakthrough and talk about how we use data to create systems and training approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. For those of you who are just joining us, this is series three, episode five. And in this series, we've been talking all about velocity and specifically the velocity culture that we've created in softball pitching. So most of the episodes in this in this series, I've been spending time really talking about not just sort of the challenges or the reasons why I feel like we've created a really negative and misinformed culture around velocity, but also really giving information about how we view velocity here at S2 Breakthrough. We've walked through things like the dashboards that we look at in order to track velocity, understanding that we take sort of a broader look at velocity, not just each individual pitch within an individual session, but velocity over time and also dependent on the time of year a pitcher is in. We look at velocity velocity um, it's from the standpoint of making sure that it's matching what an athlete's capacity for stability, rotation, power is, even outside of the motion, just a much broader view of what it takes to be able to increase velocity. I said this in a previous episode, but increasing velocity when you are about one to two years post-puberty is a very difficult task. Pitchers will go up in velocity just on their own, because of biology, going up, leading into puberty, and then about a year or two afterward, just because they are getting bigger, they're getting stronger, they're putting on more mass. That is just nature. It's at that point where essentially the an athlete or a pitcher is now in her sort of like new post-puberty body. She is stable in what that body is from a height standpoint, from a mass standpoint, putting on velocity or gaining velocity at this Uh, period of time is really actually pretty difficult and requires a lot of thought. And so two episodes ago, I talked a lot about the ways in which we really uh, train velocity with our pitchers the majority of the time here at S2 Breakthrough. And I kept referring to that as like an organic method, meaning we are really making sure that we are not just chasing something. Let's say it takes, you know, 10 steps from a hypothetical standpoint, 10 steps to really make sure that by the time you get to step 10, this is how you can safely approach velocity training. We don't just jump to step 10. We go one, two, three, four, and follow that path, follow that progression all the way up. This means we are paying attention to an athlete's stability Stability, her stability when she's on the ground, her stability when then she's in the air. When I talk about stability, I'm talking about trunk stability, the ability for her to hold posture, keep posture within the trunk as exercises and movements are getting more complex. This is our assessment process. We're measuring athletes' capacity for movement as they get more and more difficult, more and more complex, higher and higher intensities outside the motion because then it really tells us how well we can expect that pitcher to move within the motion. So we're looking at, we're making sure that st- trunk stability, both on the ground and then ultimately in the air is going up. We're keeping track of mobility, particularly of rotational capacity. So as stable as an athlete can be, can that stability ultimately translate into rotational movements? And then ultimately we're looking for not just strength, but power, how quickly that she can move the body, how quickly she can, she can generally train and still maintain that stability and that rotational capacity. When we are training athletes in that manner, then absolutely we expect velocity to go up because we expect then patterns within the pitching motion to start to improve. So when I talk about patterns, I'm talking about things like generally how well an athlete holds posture, particularly while in the air in the motion, how well her body and her arms sync up for trunk arm timing, which I will talk about again later in this episode, how well she rotates back toward her target in the back end of the motion. So essentially how much her trunk contributes to the arm from a standpoint of delivering energy and then 
really being able to decelerate appropriately. This, this means that an athlete is learning to have good, efficient pitching mechanics, but uh, efficient pitching mechanics do not exist without the things that I just talked about that we really concentrate on in our assessment and our strength and conditioning training process. So this is key. I think oftentimes in the pitching culture, we say like, I'm trying to go up in velocity, and it's all about what you're doing at pitching lessons. It's things like running and sprinting and jumping off the ground and doing things that are all about like moving really fast. And I'll talk about this at the end of today's episode of why I feel like these methods are really not the appropriate appropriate approach. But even at a baseline, it's really important to understand that before attacking an aggressive approach toward velocity in pitching sessions, we have to know that an athlete has the appropriate base. Again, we'll go into more details of that. So that's this organic method that I've talked about. We're making sure that she is really training outside of the motion in a way that's allowing her to continue to progress and continue to build more and more efficient movements or patterns within the pitching motion. So I always say, you know, an athlete's ability to jump a tier in velocity, like a standard, you know, three, two to three miles per hour in her median really is just lies in her ability to create more efficiency with her motion. So in my mind, the majority of pitchers that we are working with, that's how we're doing it. We're trying to jump up one tier within their median by making sure that she's being trained appropriately outside of the motion and then making sure that those uh, patterns and that movement capacity is translating inside the motion. Better patterns equals a more efficient kinetic chain equals more energy out to the ball. Simple as that. So when we are have an athlete at a point where we say like, yeah, check, check, check. She's getting all of those, you know, she's at this point in our assessment. She looks great. She's stable. She's training, um, you know, and really intense movements and she's able to do those, uh, successfully. She's holding the trunk steady. Um, you know, we have leveling system here at S2 Breakthrough where we would call someone a level three or a level four, as soon as they can really manage like in the air types of tasks, really high intensity tasks in multi-planes, um, multi-planar movements, then we know, okay, they're at a point now where they are not the average majority of our athletes sit in this sort of like level two, meaning that, They have general control over the trunk, but as soon as intensity increases, they start to rely on compensations through their levers. So um, when we get to that point, then my mindset shifts. Okay, now I can start to take a different approach to velocity with this pitcher, meaning that I can actively attack it in training within pitching. So the first thing that I wanna say is today's discussion is about what I do when we reach that threshold. But I really want to emphasize a major point here. This is such a rare circumstance that we have a pitcher who has the capacity to do this. So for everyone out there, every pitcher out there, young pitcher who is training for velocity, it's so important that you really reflect on, am I training it in the appropriate way and in the organic way, in a way that is not essentially jumping to step 10 without making sure my base is solid? Because if that's the case, likely that the velocity that you might pop on that given day, it's not something that will translate. And two, to the extent it does, could be actually putting you at increased risk for injury. So it's really important that we understand this. Very, very small amount of athletes actually reach this threshold where they are in in our system, a level three, level four, have trunk stability on the ground and in the air, uh, and that they can start to be pushed a little more aggressively within pitching training sessions in order to chase velocity. So, um, you know, I think just the the idea that, you know, our game is a youth game, even our outside of our pro league, uh, which obviously is, is, you know, hopefully will continue to grow. But right now, the majority of our game sits at the college level. Our oldest athletes are about 22 years old. This is a youth game. So there's a reason. It's not because, you know, we don't reach these levels of stability because, um, you know, our training systems are flawed or that may be, that may be part of it. But the reality is we're just, we're working with, with young athletes. Even 17 year olds may only be, you know, three years post puberty. So it's just important not to put the weight of the world on a 17 year old shoulders of like, we're going to do anything we can to chase 65 understanding, like give her time to do it appropriately. Give her that time to really make sure that she can build in this organic way. And that was a message that I think I shared two episodes ago of like, just because we, if, if, if I'm a, a college coach and I know I want my athletes to be able to throw 64 plus 
That doesn't necessarily mean I have to only find the 16, 17 year olds who are throwing 64 in the moment. If we had more information about what her movement capacity was like, what her trunk stability was like, what her power outside the motion was like, and we knew that essentially she was building that in a really clean and organic way, then there's no doubt about it she's going to reach numbers like that when she gets to college. So more information to me about what goes into building velocity only allows our athletes to sort of like take that pressure off of them at such young ages and allows them to just slowly grow into their goals at the right time, to reach them at the right time. So um, I just really want to emphasize that because I want to make sure that we're not coming off of this episode and that everyone's not just like running toward the approaches that I'm talking about today. It's such a small group of athletes. Very rarely is it a high school athlete. Um, If it is, likely they are one of the best athletes in the country. And uh, honestly, from our assessment process, it's not that many college athletes. So I think that's another discussion is just generally of, uh, you know, how we need to make sure that there are more athletes in college who are at this level from a standpoint of having the capacity for good, efficient movements. Um, That's another discussion for another time. But I really wanted to preface with that. that. That's really what we're talking about here, this really small category of pitchers who can attack velocity within pitching training sessions and do it in an aggressive manner. So what does it look like? Okay, so we say an athlete is level three, level four. And for those of you who uh, maybe this is your first episode, let me just sort of recap a little bit of our assessment process. So I'm going to turn over here into uh, my screen and let's talk about what our assessment process really is. So here's an example of how we're tracking our assessment. We have mobility at the top and then movement capacity. So here's an example of an athlete. She was um, a high school athlete at the time. And for the majority of her, her mobility was really clean, particularly all of her rotational mobility. And when we got down here into her movement capacity or her trunk control, here's what it looks like to be a level three or a level four athlete here at S2. So we have planes of movement, uh, exercises on the ground, totally clear in every plane of movement here on the ground. As we go into the air, we can see when she was level three, the sagittal plane, the S plane, means that her posture can hold. She is stable while in the air. Something as small as like a little frontal plane collapse and a lateral jump means like a little knee buckling. So the way she absorbed force, uh, you know, she needed to activate the posterior chain a little bit more. This is really small. And the fact that it was on two feet and not on one foot tells me probably it was just sort of like not a great jump for her. Um, And then when we looked, you know, over here under the right, what it looks like to be level four in our assessment. Again, this is really rare. We've never had someone test as a level four. This was an athlete that had trained with us for about two years at the time, and she could clean everything everything in the assessment she could clear it I should say so this is what I'm looking at so if we're like okay this athlete her patterns look good in pitching that's the first thing I have to know right is this movement capacity translating the pitching motion and I'll elaborate on that in a second but I at least know she's stable this is safe because the reality is if we're trying to really feed a high intensity movement if the body is not stable then already in the pitching motion, then the arm is taking on so much more than it's supposed to. Meaning, when the trunk is not stable and can't decelerate itself appropriately, the arm, as it's coming through, typically then takes on the responsibility of not only decelerating its own energy, as it normally does, but then decelerating a lot of the energy that's left over from the body. So the shoulder is already unstable and is already put be, being uh, placed with demands that it likely cannot handle. So it is so important that movement capacity is translating and that we know, yes, she's stable outside the motion and is that translating in the motion. So what does that look like? Okay, so I have an athlete. I know she's level three or level four in our book. This means that I know now she's shifting gears into, she's now training like VBT style, meaning how heavy can she lift as fast as possible. It's not just how heavy can she lift going on and on and on and on forever because we don't want her moving slow. We want to know, can she really push weight? Can she be strong and really produce? So put force into the ground, but do it really fast. Transfer that force really quickly. That's when we know she's ready for velocity. Okay, so now I'm going to have a check system. I'm going to go back to my computer here and I'm going to have a check system uh, just regarding what am I looking for in the pitching motion? So here's an example of an athlete and the first thing that I want to know is does she have good trunk arm timing and we've talked about this before but as I'm unraveling this athlete through her motion I know that I'm going to be looking at when stride foot hits the ground 
Is she above the layback position? That's the first thing that I want to know because timing, trunk arm timing is so critical. When the stride foot hits the ground, and we've discussed this in, I think, you know, uh, series one, but when the stride foot hits the ground, this is now going to tell the chest that it's time to start rotating back. The pelvis, as I'll talk about in a second, will have already rotated back by the time the stride foot comes down. So this is going to allow the chest to start decelerating its energy. So the layback position, when I'm directly behind the body here, that position tells my arm that it's time to start decelerating its energy. So if stride foot lands and I'm in layback at the same time, then I'm going to have my arm decelerating at the same time as my trunk. Therefore, the arm is probably taking on so much more more energy than it's supposed to. We want to allow there to be time for the body to empty its energy and then ultimately for the arm then to have time to get into its slot and only have to decel for itself. So trunk arm timing is key. If I have an athlete with poor trunk arm timing and what that would look like as I'm looking back at this screen would be that she landed somewhere around layback. So stride foot contact is occurring at layback. This is not an athlete that I would say qualifies for pitching specific velocity training because I already know that, that the arm is too fast for the body essentially. It's beating the body in timing. I don't want to then speed it up even more. So that's a really important point. So that's criteria number one. They have to have good trunk arm timing. And if they have good patterns in the pitching motion, then they should have good trunk arm timing. Redefine the Circle is brought to you by Rapsodo Softball. Whether it's at the plate or in the circle, Rapsodo delivers all the data needed to enhance your player's development and to give us a platform to become more informed and better coaches. Rapsodo pitching is absolutely critical when it comes to maximizing your pitchers. In addition to measuring velocity, pitchers and coaches get a detailed look at all of the ball metrics that influence break. Spin rate, spin direction, gyro degree, spin efficiency. Together, these metrics tell a story about a pitcher's data profile and to grow that profile and ultimately maximize what that pitcher can become, understanding the metrics is a must. Rapsodo not only provides high-level feedback in the moment, but also creates back-end reports so coaches and athletes can visualize and fully understand the entire story and how it's progressing. Rapsodo is such a powerful tool. Instant data, relevant metrics, innovative visuals, and don't forget the in-app slow-mo video that allows pitchers to watch their pitching patterns right alongside the ball flight metrics they yield. Bottom line, Rapsodo is a must-have in the world of player development. See the data, feel the results with Rapsodo's softball technology. The next thing that I'm gonna be looking at is, does this athlete have good rotational deceleration at the end of the motion? So everything that we do in pitching from our launch, so when we're launching the front half of the motion is about being on time. We wanna make sure that we get on time stride foot contact, arm above layback, but then also the strategies that we use to get on time have to then ultimately be coming from the right place. Because if I break posture in order to get into that timing, so for example, if I'm using, I'm, I'm not in good posture, and so then I'm using my stride leg or I'm lifting up with my glove arm, I'm creating time through my levers, then likely that means my trunk is not in good posture. And so what happens is even when I'm in good trunk arm timing, I don't have good enough posture to then rotate back appropriately. And so that is key. Everything in the front half of the motion is about two checkpoints. Did I get on time with the arm? And am I still in good enough position to rotate back? That is what we're looking for when we're talking about efficient patterns. Because remember, if I'm taking the approach as a coach of I'm going to then really increase the intensity at what you're throwing, then I need to make sure the arm is not taking on more workload than it already has to in the decel process. The trunk has got to be rotating back and decelerating itself. I'm going to show you some examples. Let's look back at the screen. I'm going to get this picture going. So as I get her through the front half of her motion, what we're going to see is that she does get in good trunk arm timing. You'll see she lands. She's way above layback. Here's this like X position we talk about. But if I were to show you a behind video of this, you would see that she was in a lot of extension through the back. Now for us, we obviously have biomechanics uh, data, qu uh, quantitative data to be able to look at kinematic sequence and how well somebody is rotating, particularly in the back end of that motion. But it's really quite simple to see on video as well. So as we say, she's in good trunk arm timing, but watch her D cell patterns because she achieved that she achieved that timing through the wrong parts of the body, she's not going to decelerate well. Instead, she's going to really 
like decel in more of a linear fashion, like a collapsed fashion. We would see in her graphs that she has big peaks in the sagittal plane, meaning like everything is like falling forward rather than being able to rotate. Another way that we would easily see this is that once the stride foot hits the ground, an athlete should no longer be on the side of the foot. If they are at this point, that means that there is no rotation by the pelvis, that any rotation from the pelvis is now going to happen because the chest and the arm are just pulling it there. So that is really important. I would say if you're just using video and you don't have some sort of uh, quantitative data for biomechanics, that's the number one thing I would look at. Do we start to see her go from the side of the foot to the toe when that stride foot hits the ground? That's an indicator that the pelvis is still engaged and is starting that de rotational deceleration through the trunk or up the chain and then ultimately out the arm. So if I come to this athlete now, let's get her back into her stride foot contact, which we said she's above layback. And now I think this is such a great example. I'm actually going to come back a little bit further. Let's go to top of arm circle. This is such a great example because she's also has uh, stripes on her shorts, which really make it easy to visualize. So watch the stripes on her shorts. So she's rotated you know, into this, what we would call like open position by the top of the arm circle. She's going to hit her max pelvic rotation at this point. And now as she goes to stride foot contact, watch those stripes. So she'll be a little bit on the side of the foot, not as much as we saw the other athlete. This, this uh, athlete doesn't ever get true full hip extension, different concept for another time. But what we will see is that her pelvis is still engaged. And we're seeing that as she lands on that stride foot, look what happens to the stripes on her shirt. They are coming back with her. So now if you look closely, what you'll see is the pelvis rotated back. We see those stripes when the stripe foot came down and we're starting to see like this pull across her shirt. That means the chest now is next. So now as the chest rotates, then the arm then is going to slot. And then, then you're gonna start to see those those pulls in her shirt start to gradually go away as now the chest is empty, emptying. So this would be an example of a pitcher that I would say if she was level three or level four, not only does she have the capacity to really be challenged at higher than normal intensity, but her current patterns, meaning her trunk arm timing and the way in which the order in which and the timing in which she decelerates is appropriate. And she would be an example of someone that I would actively attack a, a pitching specific uh, velocity based training model with versus the picture that I showed here. She would be someone that I would say is not ready for that yet and is still on this organic growth model. It doesn't mean that she is not chasing velocity. Absolutely this picture is in pink here. She absolutely is chasing velocity, but she's velocity, but she's staying on this organic training protocol that we've talked about two episodes ago. So I wanted to really point those out. Okay, so now let's talk about we have an athlete that, that fits all that criteria. So what do we do? So what we utilize at S2 when it comes to actively creating a training program that's for velocity is we implement underload, meaning a ball that is lighter than a softball. So we're typically using a five ounce here. And the reason for that is because we essentially are going to speed up the arm when we are giving it underload. And we are asking the brain and the body to communicate with one another in order to stay in sync with the arm. They're going to have to essentially like tap into muscle recruitment activation faster. So again, go back to this initial discussion of does the athlete ha even have the capacity to do that? So that's the first thing we have to ask. If she didn't clear what I talked about level three, level four, the answer is no. She's not really able essentially to control the body well while she's asking movements to, to or asking her muscle groups to really fire quickly. So that's why that's so important in the base. So we are now going to translate that in the pitching motion. So the implement of the underload is going to actively make the arm move faster. And now I'm asking her to really make sure that she can recruit her muscle groups to then stay on time with that arm and fire quicker. So essentially we're creating a higher than normal intensity for her. So she normally throws a softball, which is about seven ounces. That's the timing at which she's like, this is where I know I'm comfortable. Here's my timing at which I get off the ground in my launch. Here's the timing at which I'm unraveling the, unraveling the arm. And now we've like boosted that that intensity level. We've boosted that sort of like level of, of speed essentially. So she has to then recalibrate how to do that. So we're just training again, the pathways brain to body on how to do that more regularly. 
Every time we use an underload, there's so many things that go into it, which I will describe here. First thing is first, it's always task oriented, meaning there's a location that's just middle, a target, I should say, that the athlete or the pitcher has to still accomplish. And the reason for that is because if she is not doing a, an appropriate job with the body, and she's just the only the arm is moving faster, then she's gonna her timing's gonna be all over the place with delivery. She's gonna be launching the ball over the place. That's not appropriate. We're asking her to still find this element of like timing and sinking, so that everything is is really understanding like how to translate well. And so a task at the end of a, a location, a target is really critical to that. What we typically do is I start on plyos. And so I'll have an athlete throw her seven ounce plyos to really feel what it's like, you know, obviously, you know, following her appropriate warm up. start on the normal seven ounce plyo, feel what it's like to be in sync, to unravel the arm on time, to decelerate and rotate well with the body. And then we'll kind of measure where she is from a velocity standpoint with that just with plyos because it's a, such a great tool for her increasing feel and awareness. Then we'll do the same thing on a five ounce where now it's like you don't get to just launch this five ounce. You have to unravel on time. The body's got to pick its pace up. And then we will, once she's comfortable with doing that, we'll measure what those look like. And then I always come back to a seven ounce. So I'm looking at sort of seven ounce pre underload and seven ounce, so normal weight, after underload to really see what those look like um, and to collect data on those. So starting with plyos and then ultimately moving to softball where she's going to take the same approach as she's actively throwing a five ounce softball and, and still has a task to accomplish. So a couple things go into this. One, we know that we are, we are putting greater demands on the arm, on the body. There's no doubt about it. She is training. This is a very high intensity session. So her reps are very, very low. So when I'm saying she's on underload, I'm talking like three to five reps. I mean, very small and very controlled. And she has a lot of rest and recovery. So we might throw one pitch, you know, take 30 seconds off, throw another pitch. And when she's transitioning now into the seven ounce, we're taking like a full minute off, a full two minutes off. And we'll go through like one cycle of plyos with underload and softballs with underload, give her a full like five minute break, and then we'll repeat. And very rarely do I feel like our athletes can do much more than two or three rounds. They are smoked. It's such a high intensity environment for them. So it's really spaced out. Reps are absolutely like tracked because it should be low reps considering that I am creating an environment that is such high intensity beyond normal intensity. That's super important. So a couple of things that I do um, when I'm building out a, a training session like this. One, recovery is key. So we lay out for this athlete, if you are going to do a training session like this, then absolutely recovery is key. So the day before typically is an off day for our pitchers, meaning not an off day from pitching, an off day from hitting, pitching, practice, training, conditioning, whatever that may be. It's a rest day the day before and after, because I want to make sure that when the body and the arm come into that high velo situation, that training session, it's coming off of rest and that it has an opportunity to rest that she's ne then not going to go into the very next day and then put even more demands and tax the body again. So we are very deliberate about, about tracking and the schedule of our athletes and making sure that these velo days are really sitting between rest recovery days. That is key. So if you're out there and you're like, I think I qualify for, I'm a pitcher and I feel like my patterns are good enough and I can go for this approach, but you're training six days a week, like that doesn't fit. You have to be able to put in a lot of recovery. So this isn't an in-season model. This isn't an in-season approach. This is a very particular time of year where typically we're in like the back end of off season. We're in the back end of off season. We hit all of our patterns. We've done the max majority of what we're we're going to be doing on the strength floor for that off-season time period and at the end we're trying to maximize what we can tap into before we go into a little bit more of like pre-season mode the few weeks before games start so there's a very particular time of year this this fits because of how demanding it is and how much rest recovery really build in in addition to that, we also uh, make sure that we are obviously tracking velocity trends, not just within that session, but session to session. Usually we're doing about one these training sessions about twice a week. Um, so we're tracking what they look like from day one to day two, week by week by week. Uh, it depends on how much time we have with these athletes. Ideally, minimum four, six to eight weeks would be great if we had this time period. Softball is challenging because there's very little time within season. Like if an entire off 
season was six to eight weeks. That's remarkable. So um, it's we just kind of go athlete by athlete of how much time we actually have with her to implement a, a, a sort of a protocol like this with her. And then we're very careful. So all of our athletes, regardless of whether they're doing a velocity-based training uh, program or not, they are tracking wellness questionnaires daily and telling us about arm readiness, arm soreness, any pain, fatigue, stress. Uh, and so, of course, we are highly, highly, uh, we're really managing those wellness questionnaires and reports of arm soreness or pain very, very carefully during this time period. If we do all of things correctly, meaning we've hit all of those check boxes, we've made sure the athlete has appropriately reached all of those milestones we think she needs, then really, you know, typically we don't see any issues when it comes to like any issues with the arm. It's when you would take an approach like this too early, too soon, um, not too early, meaning like her age, just too early, meaning in her training development, then this is when this type of approach can be problematic. So what I want to say is like shouting from the rooftops, if you're trying to gain velocity, understand the organic appropriate progression to do so. And if you are fortunate enough to get to that sort of like top tier of athlete from the standpoint of stability, rotational capacity, power, then these are the types of things that I would recommend. Again, another layer of checklist if you meet those criteria within your pitching patterns, your pitching motion. The traditional ways in which I feel like in the pitching world we attack velocity are drills like where we have pitchers like sprint up and down. We might have them like lay on their stomach or be in some sort of like lunge position and throw. And there's a couple of reasons why I think this is not a good approach. One, First of all, highly unlikely that those pitchers have sort of reached, you know, that checklist or have accomplished that checklist of those foundational skills, those foundational sort of patterns that I believe they need to have if we're going to create an environment that's above normal intensity. So unlikely that that's even being tracked in those circumstances. And if it is, then things like that, the nature of those drills put the body in a compromised position, meaning chest all the way forward, meaning the legs attached totally to the ground or a lunge position were really quad dominant, just by the nature of what they look like and what they force the start type to look like, then they are automatically putting pitchers in position to be in poor patterns. So what's really key in order to do the things that we talked about, good trunk arm timing, good rotational deceleration at the end of the motion, you have to make sure that the way in which you're loading is appropriate, it's controlled, and it's really making sure that you're launching or unraveling the body in a very, very controlled manner. So oftentimes these start types that we do for like traditional velocity they're kind of a mess and the pitchers are flailing. You're so chest led and they're anti rotation and they're anti trunk arm timing. And so what we're, what we're doing essentially is we're putting the trunk way out front of the body, poor patterns. It's not rotating well. And we're putting on a super high intent, putting the pitcher in a very high intensity environment. And now we're like, go likely the arm is just ripping itself through drills like that. And so our approach at S2 breakthrough all of these, when I say I'm given underload or working seven ounce versus five ounce, they are all the normal pitching motion. It's the pitching motion itself. We are not, you know, having them start on the ground, um, you know, in a prone position where they're face down. They're not lunging first. They're not jumping. It's none of that. It's the normal pitching motion because we want patterns to hold. We want the rate at which we ask those muscle groups to fire to start to increase. So that's, I think, a big difference between those approaches, not only in the criteria that we, our athletes have to meet in order to get to that type of training, but also just in the approach as a whole. So I think this is just a really important discussion because we know velocity is king, velocity is queen, everyone wants to gain it. But again, I think this is just such a great example of how and why we're willing to put our athletes in such compromised positions and environments just for the sake of popping a number on a radar gun without a real understanding of what it means to really grow in velocity and how to really make a big jump. So the information is key. Doing it correctly is really how we get pitchers as a whole to throw harder, how we keep our pitchers between the high school to college level healthier, safer, better patterns, and able to ultimately throw harder as well. So um, I just think today's discussion is important. I wanted to just keep emphasize, emphasizing over and over that this is not our trip, typical training approach for the majority of our athletes. I think that message has come through loud and clear, hopefully. Um, and so um, again, I think we just got to continue to have these conversations about velocity velocity, not whether or not it is important, as I keep mentioning, but how to have the right type of information to build it 
appropriately and to build it safely. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Uh, as always, uh, it's just so exciting to get your feedback throughout the week about some questions and comments that you have about your own pictures uh, for coaches and daughters out there, for parents. Continue to keep that feedback coming. And until next time, keep questing on to redefine the circle. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on.